in for a right trip. Uh, we had a right trip this morning, and some of you all have come back, and we had a great time at lunch, and you had the opportunity to hear from a very vivacious uh, individual who is not only a scholar, but she's just a sincere and very talented individual, and I know that uh, you will certainly enjoy hearing from her. Uh, Stephen Panetto is a coordinator of this project, and we're going to hear from him uh, as to some of the details, and we will hear it in from Norma Colley. Thank you, Ms. Uh, I would like to tell you a little bit about the exhibit. Uh, some of you have heard this spiel before, so you just have to bear with me. Um, but we have an exhibit, it's called the Myrna Collie Lee exhibit, and it's actually three exhibits that we have on display. First of all, we have the Mississippi Museum of Arts uh, exhibit of Myrna's work. It's called Glad Rags, Swatches, Sketches, and Costume Design. You got it. Very well. <laughs> uh, and that's what you're seeing around the room here. The collection actually, the exhibit actually starts here in this corner, wraps around this column, and goes uh, back down this um, side of easel here, and then around the room. And that's a representation of Myrna's work for the last over the last 40 years. Uh, as I said, it starts out with her graduate work and then proceeds into some of her professional work. Uh, these are renderings um, from a variety of productions and there's a good bit of information about each of the productions in your program. Also on display, we have in the back here some costumes and those are costumes from a production of The, of the Wedding Band, which was produced by Stephen Wolf Theater in Chicago. Myrna was the designer on that production and designed these costumes. The costumes were built by Steppenwolf Theater, and they have recently donated them to the Mississippi State University Library to become a part of Myrna's collection. So we're very excited about that. Uh, next, you'll see over here in the front part some additional costumes, and those are costumes that are part of the Myrna Collie Lee Glad Rags costume collection. And those costumes were recently donated. We actually just signed the papers this uh, today at lunch, uh, where Myrna was the, actually donating those costumes to the university. And it's, we just have, what, five costumes there, but there's about several hundred more costumes uh, that are being stored over in the theater department here on campus in McComas Hall. And those are actually a working costume collection. We're very excited about that, having that, uh, that additional donation uh, by Myrna. And these costumes will not only be used by theater um, here on campus, but also will be loaned out to other theaters around the state. So we're very excited about that. And, Myrna said when she donated it that she wanted it to be, it was a working costume collection and she wanted it to continue to be a working costume collection. So we are uh, going to honor that request. Finally, I wanted to uh, make sure that you're aware of another exhibit that we have across the hall. This is a exhibit of, mat of materials that were in, that are, are in the Myrna Colley Lee co collection. I'll get it right here in a minute. Um, this is a collection of papers that Myrna donated to the university in August. We had some press about that earlier had a press conference in Jackson at the Mississippi Museum of Art. And this is representation of her work of, that she has accumulated over the last 30, 40 years. And it contains a great deal of material, research material, uh, about productions that she's worked on. I think we have, Maddie Sink was telling us earlier that we had 57 productions represented in that collection. And those are all on exhibit in the special collections area. So after you finish looking here, be sure to go across the hall and take a look at that. Um, that exhibit as well, because it gives you a whole other dimension to what Myrna has done in her career. And now I'd like to introduce Wanda Cheek from the Human Sciences Department. She's going to introduce uh, Myrna to us. Well, I'm coming. Are you going to turn these on? Hello, my name is Wanda Cheek, and I am the Chelsea Professor in the School of Human Sciences. And before I start, I just want to and before I introduce our esteemed speaker and guest of honor today, I would like to give her some idea about who is in our audience. We certainly have a number of students here from several departments on campus, as we did this morning, and uh, people from the community. So let's just stand up here just a moment. If you are here representing the theater department, the community theater in Starkville, mm -hmm. students of theater in the uh, um, excuse me, is it Department of Communications here at Mississippi State? Would you please stand just a moment so we can get a feel for the audience here? Thank you to Dr. John Ford, who is the um, department chair there. Okay, if you are in uh, fine arts or arts here at Mississippi State University, would you stand please? We have some more art students here. And then if you are from apparel, textiles, and merchandising, which is my home area, would you please stand? Oh, wow. <laughs> I have great influence. Dr. Miller and I have great influence over these students, trust me. 
Um, I, I want to make an introduction that's um, probably longer than she wants, but I think it's important to you, for you to understand where this lady comes from, what she's been doing, and for our students here to see what her career path has been all about. She basically made her way in an area, as you will soon hear from the questions that you ask, uh, into the theater world. Um, and it came about in a very unusual way. So that's question number one for the audience. How did you get into this area, okay? Because it's a very interesting uh, career path. Uh, but I wanted to tell you something about her life, and I, just bear with me a moment because I think all of this is very important. First of all, Myrna Colley Lee is a, um, a native of North Carolina. She didn't spend her whole time there, but she is from that area. She received her MFA degree in scenic, uh, scenic and costume design from Temple University. And she also studied scene painting and properties at Brooklyn College, and she completed a, a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Art Education from what is now the University of North uh, Carolina at Greensboro. Now, her theatrical work, I think, is very important. Her most recent work as a costume designer includes productions such as Re uh, Relativity at the St. Louis Black Rep, The Piano Lesson at the Cleveland Playhouse, Forest City at the Cleveland Playhouse, and The Wedding Band for Steppenwolf Theater, which Stephen just referenced a few moments ago. Other credits include the Cable Ace award-winning video production of uh, Eugene O'Neill's Long Day's uh, Journey Into Night with Ruby Dee and Earl Hyman Jr., the world premiere of the American Music Festival production of the Opera X, which is the life and times of Malcolm X. And uh, she also did the costumes for Mothers, uh, which was commissioned by Bill Cosby and performed at the Crossroads Theater. Isn't that a mouthful? I mean, this tells you <laughs> something about her life. Upcoming projects for this year include the world premiere of Teal, a new work by Effa Baeza in uh, conjunction with Rights and Reasons Theater of Brown University. And as you see now, her glad rags, uh, sketches, swatches, and costume designs by Myrna Colley Lee. That's what we're seeing here today. She's going to soon be involved with an independent film, or probably already is, with an independent film called The Reprieve. Am I doing okay on this? It's fine. Okay. Um, she has, in addition to being a costume designer for the theater, she has been a costume designer, art director, and set director, or designer rather, for film and television production. She has faculty, um, has held faculty and staff positions with Smith College, the Kennedy R uh, Center's uh, American College Theater Festival, and also at the Design and Management Institute of the National Arts Consortia in uh, New York. Now, a very important thing about her is not only has she had a professional life, but this is a mark to me of a very strong woman who um, sees her obligation to the civic duties calling upon her. And she's going to talk us some about that if you'll just ask her the question. But she serves as, a, I know I've heard these wonderful things already this morning. Myrna serves as, the commission, as a commissioner for the Mississippi Arts Commission, is on the board uh, for the Charleston Arts Revitalization Effort, the Rock River Foundation, uh, the Mississippi State University Department of Art, and the Gertrude C. Ford Center for Performing Arts, which is on the University of uh, Mississippi's campus. Um, she also serves on the Acquisitions Committee of the Mississippi Museum of Art and on the Steering Committee of the Charleston Arts Center. She has, so, she has such a broad perspective to bring to you today. I want to close out by stating, though, that she and her husband reside on, on their farm some of the time in Charleston, Mississippi. Um, my hope for you today is that you will gain insight into how she has blended so much of what we study. It's the culture. It's the region, it's the mores, it's the historic costume, it's the theater, it's all these things that we bring together into a melting pot to produce the career that you've been into. Thank you, Verna Kali Lee. Thank you. Now, you have to ask her questions. <laughs> please, please ask me questions. I respond great to questions. So how did you get started in this? <laughs> <laughs> the question. Um, I had a roommate who was an opera singer who couldn't sing anymore and needed to stay in theater. She felt she needed to, so she started a theater and drafted me. At the time, I was an art teacher uh, in um, undergraduate school, you know, from first grade to twelfth grade. 
And so she got me for costumes, because I could sew, and for scenery, because I could paint, and posters, and flyers, and programs, and anything. And I discovered I liked it, so then I started going to school for it. So I started in a whole nother career, and sideways got into theater. Any other questions? <laughs> For theater, it was my roommate. I hadn't, uh, as a child, seen much theater. I lived in Texas and Florida and uh, North Carolina, and there wasn't much theater at the time. So I don't think I saw a theatrical production, and it was a ballet until I was 14 years old in Houston, Texas. Uh, <coughs> so my biggest inspiration for theater was my roommate, the opera singer. <laughs> It's like picking from children, you know, which one's your favorite child. I, I think the wedding band, because, it, uh, because we got to build everything. It was 1917, 1918, and you don't find many items of clothing that are big enough, first of all, for, for people now. People were so tiny then, and uh, that would be strong enough to be in a play. So we had to build everything, including the men's costumes. Everything but a World War I uniform. We managed to get that from, I think that was made for, you know, the enactment groups that uh, they have costumes that you can get. Anyone else? Hmm? I'm not quite sure how to frame this. <coughs> when you design, are you designing from text or the relationship between text and time of the original production of a show such as, say, uh, Taming the Shrew a moment ago. Mm -hmm. I, I saw it, uh, this earlier when the setting was up uh, a couple of weeks ago, and I was really, really struck by, by those that I like Shakespeare very much. Mm -hmm. I was really astounded by how wonderfully they captured not only the text of the play, but also the, the period in the late 16th century. So tell us a little bit about history and, and people that, that you designed with and for. Okay. You are inspired primarily by the, by the words, the play, the text. The play is the thing, you know, it's the main thing. The second main thing would be the director's point of view, his choice of when he wants to set it. Because I, you've, if you like Shakespeare, you've obviously seen productions that weren't done in the period they were written for. So if a director feels that he can make it work, if the sensibility of the play is such that it fits in another time period, then they may change it. Then your costumes are totally different. So the director tells you what he wants it to be. That was a graduate school uh, project, so we were required to learn the period that it was written for. And in learning the period, you had to do the research, and then you had to dress the characters according to what the, the um, lines told you they were about. You know, if they were foppish or conservative or flamboyant or just any number of words or shrewish. <laughs> Good distinction between the author and Shakespeare. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think that answered. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thinking about historical costumes. Um, is it more difficult to design for working class or uh, poor ca characters than more uh, opulent, wealthier? Well, no, it's just, just not. Because I, the reason I ask that is because I'm just thinking that there's maybe fewer living examples. But paintings. Paintings are primary <coughs> research, and there are painters that paint people in everyday life, street scenes, all kinds of uh, situations that you can gather information from. And of course, if it's within recent times, photography is where you find it. And you find research in, in all kinds of odd places like coal miners, a book about photographic essay about coal miners. If you needed somebody that was uh, working in that kind of situation that didn't have money, you can find the research. The research is the best part. 
librarians are your friend. <laughs> <laughs> and art books and photography books. So research is uh, everywhere, really. Somebody's looked it up, found it, or collected it together some kind of way. You can find it. In graduate school, they teach you how to research. So you're steeped in art history and photography. And you uh, can find anything you need. Finding the fabrics that translate sometimes are hard, is harder. Fabrics today are not the same, and synthetic fabrics don't even begin to approach what natural fabrics did, the movement of them. So it's sometimes harder to do opulence with synthetic fabrics. They just don't come off opulent. <laughs> they don't move well at all. Anyone? The first thing I do is f look for bodies from paintings or drawings or anything that have the attitude I want for the character. Having read the, the part of the script, I know who this person is from the things they say and the things the play says they do. Uh, then I look for a body that has that attitude and I draw that as my body outline and then I proceed to dress it. It's kind of like paper dolls. You create the body from all kinds of research that you can find. And that means you can use photographs that have nothing to do with what you're doing. They just have the attitude you want. So part of my research is finding the body attitude and person. And sometimes I'm superimposing a head <laughs> so that it's one part here and one part there. Uh, it's when you want to get in the neighborhood of foreshortening, to, to draw it, that you have to really do a lot of research because you've got to find that in order to draw it, unless you can afford to have a live model stand there and pose for you until you get it right. Anything else? Do you do the sewing and construction also, or is that part of the costume design, or does someone else do that once you do the drawing and all that? In graduate school, it was part of the process because we had to learn all of it. But since graduate school, uh, regional theaters have their own costume shops. I haven't touched a sewing machine <laughs> in centuries. <laughs> it's very time consuming to build the costumes. And there's so much detail to shopping for the fabrics and finding the accessories and creating the hats if they don't have a hat department and purses and that you don't have time to build them. Uh, small theaters that don't have much money, you kind of end up doing everything yourself. And that's hard. And you just hope you live long enough to outgrow that. <laughs> <laughs> do, you design, do you design in different ways for different theaters? Say, for a small theater, would you take into consideration that this is a theater that might not have as much money to spend? Oh, truly. Or? You have to. Uh, part of your job is to come in at budget or under. It's what they'd like. <laughs> and so you, you have to produce it the way they can afford it. Uh, that doesn't always mean that you're totally limited and that you can't pull it off at all. Sometimes other periods are useful. If you can tear up costumes and reconnect them and you know, make a dress out of the drapes. <laughs> uh, there's all kinds of stuff around that's free. In, in New York, where I was for the most part of the early part of my career, there were costume houses that would regularly clear out costumes that were too old or too damaged, and they would just put them in a pile over on the side, and anybody who wanted it could take it. I would haul that stuff off <laughs> by the truckload. <laughs> because the theaters that I was working for you know, were um, I did a black nativity on $135 once, and it, was, it came out beautifully. But we had a Cabbage Patch doll for the baby Jesus, and, <laughs> <laughs> and we had baby blankets and all kinds of things for you know, supplements. You just do what you have to do. The audience is not close to the action, so they can't see. That's why theater costumes don't really have to be perfect. They're not streetwear. They're illusion.
And you can create an illusion with a lot of stuff that's put together interestingly. <laughs> With regional theater, though, that has costume shops, then you have the luxury of having people building what you ask for, and they take care in doing that beautifully, because for them it's a statement of their work, so they're not trying to give you jerry-rigged clothes. But for small theaters, you do, you do what it re is required. That's the job. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, having been an art major first, I think I enjoy creating the renderings. Maybe too much. I spend too much time with it sometimes. <laughs> so they end up suitable for framing when they really, sh <laughs> when they really should that be. They are working drawings. They are supposed to inform the costume shop of what they're making. And when they have the conference with you about it, they sit with the drawing and talk to you about every seam and every item that you're asking for. So they're tearing it apart. You don't need to spend forever to do it, unless it's your own personal foible. How do you choose the color that goes to each costume? Like, do you make that decision? Or? Yes, you make that decision. You make it sometimes before you're doing the whole costumes, you come up with a palette for the show. Uh, when you are deconstructing the, 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 um, the play to figure out who's on stage at the same time, you need to figure out what colors they are so that they're either complementary or contrary to each other, depending on the tension you want in the scene. And so you don't end up with two people in the same thing, or two people the same color as the set, or any of the really horrible things that could happen. <laughs> So you are in control of that all the time. So you make a palette sketch. Somehow I seem to be able to do that in my mind. But I've seen people make palette sketches that is just a piece of paper and each person will have a, a name and then colors. That's their color range. And they'll play around with that first and then start the rendering so that they've got a range of it. I suppose it depends on what part of your artistic vision you develop most. I think color is probably one of the easiest things for me to deal with. Color and texture. There was a question further back than the first walkthrough row. Guess so. The rendering. I like rendering. I design while I'm rendering. It's a lot of erasing. <laughs> uh, by the time I get to color, I've already figured out what, it, what the costume is. But the drawing is the designing for me. You know, changing the line. It helps if I already know who the actor is, but you don't always know. Sometimes they're hiring people two days before it starts, and so you are not designing for that particular person, you're just designing for the character. Sometimes I can make the drawing look like the person if they've sent me a headshot early. That's really good for the actors. They kind of like being able to see who they're about to be. Unless they already had their own idea. Then, <laughs> <laughs> then you adjust, you know, it is a, it, it is a collaborative medium. <laughs> that can get hairy. <laughs> Uh, I do as the communication to the costume shop. They actually do that. But yeah, rigging a costume for quick changes is 90% of the last fitting. It's to make sure they can get in it and out of it in time, including rigging shoelaces so they can step out of a laced up shoe and get it back on, probably. And sometimes they have to do it on stage. So then you have to make it still look like a costume rather than rip away. You don't want to hear Velcro rip on stage. <laughs> and somebody dashes out of a costume and you can hear it rip. <laughs> it should look like they're actually doing what it is. I mean, if it's buttons, for instance, then it has to unbutton. 
but maybe some of them are rigged and some of them are real buttons. You're talking about all, all of your favorites. I want to know if you have a biggest mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, uh, biggest mistakes. I ah, once tried to use an antique costume on stage, and it lasted about two performances, and fell apart. Not quite on stage. <laughs> but we had to find something else before she could go back on in it. So it's an important lesson to learn just how old a costume is and how fragile it is. Some fabrics just dry rot, and all of a sudden they disintegrate. That was maybe the biggest mistake. That was the biggest mistake. <laughs> <laughs> hmm? Yes, what advice would you give to uh, people who are faced with failure while they're trying to accomplish something? Failure how? Um, well, if, if they have a goal set in mind and they seem to not be accomplishing it, you know, and they're failing at something they would like to do, what kind of advice Oh. Well, hmm. you kind of got to stick to it if you're going to do it. I mean, if stuff knocks you down, it's just a job. You know, you'll live through it, <laughs> actually. <laughs> and so doing, you will learn something from that, actually. It'll take a little while to notice what that was, maybe. Uh, <laughs> you'll have to step away from it and figure out, okay, what did I learn there? But I don't know if failure is a good, you mean in design? Well, yeah, my, my next question would have been like, if, for example, for a student who is trying to design some sort of clothing or has you know, something in their mind or frame, frame of mind, excuse me, that you know, they'd like to design, or, and they're having trouble coming up with exactly you know, what they're trying to do. Um, <coughs> You're just beginning? Uh, yeah. I think what you learn most when you're beginning is where your creative space is. So that each time you design something, you learn a little more about <coughs> that. For me, it's often things that have nothing to do with what I'm designing. It'll just come to me driving or, you know, it'll happen. You have to learn to trust that, so you have to keep doing it in order to get past all that so that you begin to have a style of designing or a process. So you just have to hang in there, really. It has to mean enough to you that you just keep trying. And there is no such thing as a failure. I mean, what is it for, a grade? If you don't come up with the costume that you liked and somebody says, yuck, then, you know, do another one. <laughs> <laughs> It won't, uh, it's not going to make you or break you. It's, it's really only part of the process. It's a process. It's like, I don't think anybody ever likes the whole thing they did. You might be there on the first preview and go, oh God, why did I make that skirt like that? <laughs> As they're walking across the stage and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> so you learn to like it or, or you hate it and you never do another one. <laughs> For fashion design? Boy, I know almost nothing about fashion <laughs> design. Uh, it's very different from costume design because you're creating something for a general market and mine is very specific to a situation and a play. And so costumes, even though we use real clothing sometimes, is not clothing design. It's It's creating a character. It really is the assistance of the play. It's, um, it's one of the tools the, actors uses, the actor uses. Don't know much about marketing. 
Sorry, I can't answer that one. Oh, yes, ma'am. Other than your fashion illustrations, were you ever asked to do flats or would you they just kind of be your fashion illustrations and construct the garment from them? Well, it's more complicated than that. So they look at it and talk to you about it and figure out where the seams are and they draft a pattern from it. Uh, sometimes they might ask you what your research was so they can see what you had in mind if you're not showing them enough of it. You know, if you, most of the time you don't do a full frontal view, you do slightly turn sideways so you can see where seaming is. They may ask you what the back is like. If you know that's coming, you may draw a little sketch about the back. It's a, um, the meeting where you take your drawings into the costume shop, they're determining yardages, they're telling you what to go buy, because you shop for the fabrics. They are asking you questions about how it's used. You have to know a lot about it by that time. So, um, <clears throat> I don't know. They wouldn't just take a drawing and you not show up and talk about it. I don't think, I've never had that. That's the, uh, the biggest process, the biggest connection between you and the costume shop is your drawings. That's your, that's your wish list. This is what I want it to look like. How can you help me get there? They'll tell you how much fabric to buy. They'll tell you that they need to put elastic in certain places to make what you think is going to happen, happen. Costume designers don't always know how to sew. Uh, it's like uh, housing, housing designers aren't builders. <laughs> Theater designers don't do shows. <laughs> it's, um, you know how to make them look. Somebody else teaches you how to f make it work. In the graduate school process, though, you do learn how to construct costumes. So you are supposed to know some about it. It just wouldn't be, I wouldn't go out and call myself a cutter and draper. I don't really know how to do it. I know what they do but I don't know how to do it. Uh, yes. I know that theater can be kind of a fickle business because when the show is over, the show is sometimes over. Do you, you ever have, have, have trouble finding a job in between times? Or do you just sort of fall into For a costume designer, the person that hires you most of the time is a director. <clears throat> They'll say they want you and they'll talk the theater into hiring you if the theater can afford to bring you there. And that doesn't mean your price as much as the transportation and the housing. They have to be able to put you up, you have to be able to come back and forth. But most regional theaters function that way. They are accustomed to bringing in designers, they don't have people on staff. There are some situations where you'd work for a theater and you're their primary designer, so you're there for a season or two. The nice part about it is that it's over because uh, it's not a, f costume design is a full-time job, but designing one show is not. So it's kind of nice that it's over, and that you get another one, and then another one. <laughs> uh, building the career is a matter of saying yes to just about every job at first, mm -hmm. until you get a reputation and you get a crew of people. It's networking. So once the people know what you can do, then they ask for you. I was already working in theater before I knew what I was doing. <laughs> then I went to graduate school. <laughs> and by the time I came out, it was, we were all, we knew each other. So I knew all the directors, I knew half the actors, I knew all the theaters. I was in New York, I was in an area where there was a lot of theater, so I don't think I've ever actually looked for a job. <laughs> if, you're in an, if you want to be a theater designer, you need to be where there's a lot of theater. You really do, because then you can work a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I know with being involved in theater, you're, you're around a bunch of people that are from different walks of life. You have so many diversities. Um, what are some different educational backgrounds? Because I know everyone mm. did not major in theater or did not major in fashion design or costume design specifically. They did marketing or merchandising or textiles. What is to come to costume design from fashion design, I know some costume designers who've come from fashion design. Uh, what's the question? 
I was I was just trying to say what different, how many different types or what different types of educational backgrounds come together to make it so successful. Because I know to be a costume designer, you don't necessarily have to only design for um, specific, specific periods, like if you do um, television. Right. So then it's yes. modern. Yes, modern. Fashion probably translates to television e most easily, right. uh, and maybe videos. So if you wanted to go that direction, and you wanted to do a more modern, that you could more so associate yourself with, maybe someone like myself and my age demographic, how would I network or put my foot into the door? Since it's so hard to come across contact information. Goodness. Uh, that's a hard one. Um, usually, I don't know how a designer would get started to go directly to television. I know a lot of theater designers who've done television design and then go to movies. I think the design process, though, is a matter of learning about research because you might get... Did you see Lackawanna Blues? Okay, it's a television, made-for-television movie, but it was about the 20s and 30s and 40s, actually, it ran a, a long span. So the person who designed that, though they were designing for television, had to know period. So the, the, the process that you learn in design school is that how to research. Once you know how to research, you can design anything because it's just a matter of finding the visual information. Then you can do it. If somebody wanted to do a video and they wanted to do King Tut, they wanted to do an Egyptian dance, though it's a modern piece of music, then you'd have to be able to research the Egyptian period and translate that to something the dancers could use. So I think that the, the design part is the same. You just have to learn how to do the research and to present your ideas, collage or drawing. The finding the network, I think you have to be in a city where there's television. Lots of it. <laughs> Uh, those jobs, however, are union, and there are, there are exam processes that you could go through to get in the union. Uh, they're covered by unions. Uh, IATSE, I believe, is a union that covers the costume designers for movies and theater. Um, they have, a, I'm sure they have a website. And they have all kinds of uh, postings for the times that you're allowed to take the exams. And they may even have intern programs. I should imagine they would. And so you can look them up. Uh, probably just visit a television studio that does live programming. The problem with most <coughs> local television is that they don't do any live programming. So it's not anything they start. It's something they've brought in that somebody else has already done. So they may not be as beneficial for you. Mm -hmm. That help at all? I may be useless if you want to, <laughs> if you want to do something other than theater. Just curious from your perspective, what exactly do you think is the most necessary skill that this kind of field needs? Like, what is it? Research and rendering. Learning to research, learning where to find what it looks like, whatever it is, if they need it. You've got to know what it looks like. Um, so you have to figure out ways to find that. Libraries and museums are probably the best resources. But if it's very modern, very current, then it's all over the street. So then you just have to learn to look. Probably then photography, your own camera and snapping pictures and collecting your own file of pictures and keeping things around that you need so that you're not reinventing the wheel when it's time to, to do something, because you won't have the time. Did that answer? Okay. Somebody right in front of you. Huh? This is probably unfair. <laughs> <laughs> it, it isn't. Okay. Uh, obviously, there are a number of different elements that, that constitute quality in a, in a workspace. The reason I think that you're familiar with is that you're familiar Which has the best costume shop? Hmm. Cleveland Playhouse. They have the best uh, costumes. Well, Steppenwolf did too. Actually, all the regional theaters have very good costume shops. And what makes them good is the person who manages it first. Uh, if that's organized well and they have access to, to 
resources like thrift stores and resale shops and uh, antique clothing stores, then you can do almost any play that they're probably going to choose for their season because they have shoppers, they have the ways to get you to where you need to go, and they can help you accomplish what you need. They usually have the space already and their own seamstresses and tailors and special people that make Oh, for instance, if you had to do Harvey and you had to produce that rabbit, then you need somebody who can do masks well because you're not doing any of it yourself, so the shop's doing it. The reason I say Cleveland Playhouse, though, is because Cleveland Playhouse is a regional theater in a town with a ton of rich people, and they support the theater by giving their clothing <coughs> to the theater when they don't use them anymore, so they have a space as big as this whole section of this building, two rows high, full of clothes that you can go shopping through when you need to dress a play. So if it's anywhere from 1912 to now, they have the clothes. That, unfortunately, was one of the dresses that fell apart. <laughs> but at least we had it and we could make another one. We could find a fabric and they made it overnight. They made it for the next night's performance. They just got three people, they were on it, <laughs> they did it, and it was over the next night. So support, you know, a, a, a theater, a regional theater has a lot of support for design. It's, and they get it by having a community base that's very strong. People that march into the community and get people in the community to give them what they need, one way or the other. People's children give them the clothes. When their parents die and they've got a house full of old stuff, they give it to the theater. So you get radios and glassware and table linens and, and then they just need the space to house it. Cleveland has this monster building. So it's heaven, you know, it's shopping. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, I was an intern myself <laughs> at one point. And the costume designer that I worked with was Patricia McGordy. She worked for the public theater in, um, in New York City. And in graduate school, well, in the summer after graduate school, she was uh, looking for an intern, and I volunteered. Internships are slavery. You pay them sometimes, you know. <laughs> they don't pay you. <laughs> so. Um, but you, what you learn is something you would have had to pay for uh, in a course. And they just give you things to do. And you're watching them function. You're watching their relationship with the costume shop. You're sometimes helping them with part of that. I pulled shoes for her for Pirates of Penzance. That was my whole job. I had to dig through the shoes, find the right shoes, make them the colors that she wanted them to match the, the uh, costumes, have them there for rehearsal, check what was wrong with them. If they hurt, we had to stretch them. You know, just the shoes. The shoes were the whole job. Do you feel like you learned more then when you were really working under someone who already entered than you feel like you learned more in that situation than you would have in school? No, it was different because, not more, just an, another facet of it. Uh, it was putting to use what I had learned. I had learned in graduate school about doing these things, but I didn't have the responsibility to do it. And once I was assigned to a person and she said, go do the shoes, I had to create the list, I had to check everybody's sizes, I had to figure out what she wanted. If she hadn't drawn it, she might tell me, you know, slip on or lace up. And then I had to give her choices, she had to pick. So it became, I became a support for her to accomplish what she had in mind. Um, long hours, but again it was the public theater, so it's almost like Cleveland Playhouse. Tons of stuff, you know, just rooms and racks. Once they buy costumes, if they have to buy anything, they don't give it away. That's why I don't have many costumes f from shows that I've done. The theater doesn't give them up. They own them. They use them again for something else. Mm -hmm.
Have you worked on any projects that are set in the future? Maybe science fiction or something like Babylon 5 where you not only have humans but you have alien creatures and... Uh... I did one at Smith College. It was uh, women as kind of future warriors. I, we had to create head gear for them because they had kind of like mohawks and they were bald on the sides. <laughs> so we had to create something that would make that happen. And in a college situation, uh, it's a good way to work because you've got a lot of work, workers. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of people to accomplish what you need. And decent budgets. Yeah, those are fun. <laughs> Uh, you get to try all kinds of new materials, and they want you to in school. So they want you to do vacuform, and they want you to, to make um, puppets, and it stretches you more than some of your jobs will. You may never, ever get to do some of the things you learn in graduate school again. But then somebody might come up with a little play that requires all that and has a budget of $500, and then you have to figure out how to do it real well on nothing. So it all stretches you. All of it's part of the learning process. Any way you get it is part of the learning process. Mm -hmm. Speaking of budgets with $500, <laughs> I'm just wondering if um, you were still involved with the community in, in Mississippi, what would it take I see. I haven't done community theater in a long time. Um, because I'm usually working in regional theater, I developed my whole, um, hmm, my whole networking system is regional theater. It was what I intended to do. I went to graduate school at 36 years old, so I was way past starting a career. I had already had a whole career and decided to change my mind. So I knew what I wanted. I even chose some of the plays that I wanted to draw in graduate school. So sometimes they were doing plays that weren't interesting to me because I figured I would never even need it. So I would ask to substitute a play that I thought would be better in my portfolio, and they would let me. Um, and then it exposed the other students to another play at the same time they were doing one. So it kind of was a trade-off. It was good. I had to stand up and talk about what the play was. And it was mostly black theater. So they didn't know the plays. So I could acquaint them with, uh, with a play they wouldn't under otherwise know, and then I would have to design it so then they would see it. So it gave them two for the price of one, and it gave me two for the price of one. And I got it for my portfolio. What would it take for me to design? <laughs> <laughs> well, at the moment, I, I'm working so much. I you know, I'd maybe do two or three design shows a year now. And I'm on a lot of boards. <laughs> and I'm a commissioner for the Mississippi Arts Commission, and that's a lot of work. We meet four times a year and give away money. <laughs> and the decision process behind giving away money is <laughs> you think keeping up with a budget is big. <laughs> uh, I'm always interested. I, sometimes I'd like to work with young designers. If they're designing something, I could maybe give them ideas, that would be maybe better use of my time because I wouldn't be able to stay the whole time. So if you have a designer and he or she needs to talk through what they're doing and try to figure out how it works, that would work if you could get them to me or get me to them. <laughs> and email is great these days. <coughs> email and, and uh, photography so that they could take pictures of what they're trying to do and I could comment. I'm great at commenting. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> and there's a question. You earlier uh, it's announced that you were working on a new off-Broadway show. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us? It's a one-woman show called Becoming Adele. Becoming Adele. My assistant's back there. Uh, and um, it's a director that I directed, uh, that I worked with at uh, Cleveland, in Cleveland, Mississippi. At the, um, university. what is that? Miss what is the name of that school? Delta. Delta. Delta State, yes, at Delta State. And he asked me to come and do this one with him because I suppose he enjoyed working with me and figured I could do it. Its budget is $500. <laughs> They're not even paying me a lot, but I only have to stay there for five days. They are allowing me to do it in a compressed kind of fashion. We figured out how to make that happen so that I could go get it done and leave. I won't even get to see it finished. But he's trusting. 
I'll see it in a rehearsal. I just, I don't think I'll see a uh, paid performance. But once it's set, it's set. I don't expect anything to happen. And it's one woman, three costumes. So it's not awful, you know, it wasn't undoable. Mm -hmm. Say the last part, I didn't hear you. Do you ever feel like something mirrors maybe a design you've done before? Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, that can happen. Sometimes characters are similar. Hopefully, the period's different so that you don't really turn it into the same person over again. Uh, yeah, you can get stuck. It's like writer's block. Designer block is, is just like writer's block. And sometimes you just have to go away from that one and do another one, and then maybe come back to it. And you might not get it until you see the actor read it. And then the actor will inform it differently and all of a sudden that's the one you draw that night. <laughs> come back in the next day and go, oh, this is what this was supposed to be. Inspiration comes from funny places and it's not always, uh, well it's almost always informed by the text, but it's not always readily apparent. You have to read the script a lot of times. Hearing a real actor give it voice and interact with the other actors helps a lot, though. It really does. That first read through has made me change a costume sometimes. Not the whole thing, but some part of it. And body type, what the actor actually looks right, like, will make it very different from what you thought you saw. You know, somebody tall, skinny was what you had in mind, and the person they cast is not that at all. It's like, okay. <laughs> Watercolor, for the most part, uh, permanent or watercolor magic markers. Because you want to blend colors, so you want something that's movable. Uh, I have friends that use alcohol-based dyes, though. They're. Uh, I guess it's what you started out with and you're comfortable with. Watercolor was what I was most comfortable with. I knew it, so I could do it fast. What you don't want to do is labor over it forever. It's just a rendering. It really shouldn't be suitable for framing. <laughs> well, I mean, it could be suitable for framing, but it's not supposed to be a finished artwork. It's a sketch. Can you talk about the collages? Ah, collages. The collage is what I do when it's modern period and I can find it in a, in a store or in a, in a costume warehouse. It's probably from the 30s on to now, meaning that it's probably not so dry rot that it's going to fall off of them before the show is over with. And then there's no point in rendering because you're not going to find, oh, the budget has to be low enough that you're not building, so you are buying. Uh, so I put together a collage from the research and sometimes I hand color them in, sometimes I don't even bother with the color because what you're going to find and have hanging on a rack will inform you as to your palette. That and the costume design, the set design. You want to avoid clothes that are the same color as the set. <laughs> so I use collage as, as a shopping list. It's what I use to find the costume for that character. Uh, scale gets interesting in, uh, in a collage because you don't always find the hat the size of the head you found. But sometimes that's a very, it makes an emotional content to the collage and you can play with the character. Especially, I have one who has a big hat, uh, not that big a head, and he was an egomaniac. It was just the perfect thing for the character. <laughs> It just said it, you know, you looked at it and you know, oh, guy's got a big head. <laughs> and he's full of himself. Uh, the collage process is fun, because collaging is uh, playing with scale and uh, some givens, but you can play with the givens. The Xerox machine or a copier is your friend when you, when you do that collage. Because then you can take the research, reduce it, enlarge it, cut it up, use parts of it, move it around, color in it. It's another rendering process. 
The DMF looks like it has some cut, some ties in it. <laughs> Stephen knows too much about my exhibit. <laughs> um, that was a college production of Medea Myth. And it was about Medea, the ancient uh, high priestess who murdered her children. And it was, I used the, I had neckties, a big, vast collection of neckties. And you know how some ties are referred to as power ties because of the color? I wanted to make these togas. And I used the neckties to make the togas because they're ready-made. They end up in points. And they can be about the length of a man's body if it's going to be a short toga. And so we pinned all the neckties together and made two togas. And there was no sewing. They were all pinned. And I took my ties home when it was over. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't have to cut them. We didn't have to do anything to them. I think that's here somewhere, isn't it? I think you'll see it if you get up close to it. It was very successful. So they had a fully silk costume for not silk money. <laughs> mm -hmm. What you figure out is that they're not visual, and so they don't know what they want. Um, but they have the same budget constraints that you do, and so sometimes you have to remind them about budget. <laughs> if they keep trying to make you change, you know. The strategy is, is to talk to them a lot. Take them out for dinner, talk about the costume, because they might not be able to share with you what they see at first, because maybe they don't see it. But the more you talk about what it is, the more they can tell you, maybe they can tell you what it's not. Some way you have to get a hook on it. And I think for them, maybe you have to give them collages at first, so you don't waste the time fully designing the thing and then they hate it. Uh, you give them something to react to and be prepared that they will, and then talk a lot. It's, you got to get them, have to draw them out. Patience, <laughs> I guess that's the biggest strategy. And trying to get to know them. It's a new director that you've never worked with before? Um, no, actually, I had one that every time you'd ask me to draw on something, you would tell me, that's exactly what I asked for, but that's not what I want. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like power play. I don't know. That's, um, that's, uh, it, it's hard. You just have to keep trying to draw them out. Have you got time for all that? No, we really didn't. Hmm. Sometimes you have to just tell them, you know. You got to give me more information. I can't give you what you want. You know, make sure you let them know you're trying to give them what they want. Psychologically, that's a friendship base. I mean, that's, you know, that comes from a friendly place. Sometimes you have to put your foot down. <laughs> because there's just so much time you can give the design process before you have to commit to, to making the costume. So after a while they have to let go of that if they can't communicate and they can't get you. It sounds like he doesn't know what he wants until he sees it. And then he knows what he doesn't want. Yeah, that's hard. Hope you don't work for that one anymore. <laughs> right, that's, that's one of the things you learn, who not to work with. I had drawn it in graduate school without considering what the fabrics would be. So I knew what I wanted everybody to look like. And then I needed to just accomplish it. So I had lots of friends. It was a very Afrocentric time. People had pieces of fabric a lot that they just kept around. They draped it over tables. They wore it as shawls. They tied it around themselves in uh, African dress. So I knew who had the fabric. <laughs> I'd seen it. 
So, and they were friends. And when you promise not to damage it, they're, they're willing. And they're in theater too, so they understand that you don't have much money. And they're kind of proud to see their stuff in the show. Uh, I've even had a director to loan a costume. Uh, in Relativity, the director loaned the costume for one of the men characters because he owned it and I couldn't find it. And he said, well, I have it. And he's about my size. He happened not to be. He happened to be smaller and I had to take a pleat in the shoulders. But you just based it. You don't sew it for real. Um, didn't cut anything. Just managed to make it happen. A lot of basting. A lot of overlapping, basting, hiding things. Um, I don't know, you just pull it off. People will loan you things. If you give it back, good. Don't hurt the stuff, because you'll never get it again. And they'll never finish talking about you. <laughs> great costume shop. Steppenwolf has a costume shop that is an independent shop that will make costumes for Steppenwolf and their deal is afterwards they own them so they can rent them out. So they make the money. Steppenwolf pays for the fabric, doesn't own the costume. The shop owns the costume. And so those costumes, I don't think the wedding dress was rented that much, but the man's suit was rented a lot. And then they gave it to us. They probably had gotten their money out of it. They had a shop with um, a shopper, three cutter drapers, a costume shop foreman person that ran it, a tailor, um, a shoe person, a hat person, and a person that was in charge of the jewelry. So it was like shopping. You know, once I showed them the costumes, the shopper took me out, we bought the fabrics, they had all the, the, uh, the yardages that I needed. She had size measurements. We just went to fabric stores and found the fabric. The budget was high. It was a $7,000 budget. So it was easy to do, you know. It wasn't a hard thing to do. And in Chicago, the fabrics are there. There are lots of uh, fabric stores that have natural fibers and laces and all kinds of good stuff. Uh, we didn't use any polyester. <laughs> no synthetic fabrics, actually. Um, lots of support. It was a joy to work there. Different than Cleveland Playhouse. Cleveland Playhouse didn't have quite that many people, but now Cleveland Playhouse had a lady who would dye things. Her whole job was just dyeing. Fabrics, shoes, leather, anything. So she could make it the color you wanted if you couldn't find the fabric. <laughs> and she could make a shoe match anything. <laughs> and they've been doing it all, you know, they're attached, it's their jobs forever. They don't give up those jobs. If they have a, a theater that uh, can pay them, they work there, they're loyal. At the Fox Theater in Atlanta, Georgia, I worked with a dancer, choreographer, director, who had a vision. Well, it was a tiny actress playing a big rock star. She was little. And it was a learning process for me because I guess what I didn't see and what he knew, he had done The Wiz. So he already knew big as a, as a dancer and a choreographer. And then as a director, he knew how big he wanted her to be. I had never done a big musical. So I accomplished every other character but this one. And Jasmine Guy was the actress. And she's teensy. I mean, really teensy. And she didn't have that kind of stage presence. She's better in film and in television. Some people are small screen and some people are big stage. And I lost her. She was, wasn't on the stage. Everybody else in her whole number was on stage and you couldn't find her. And he was right. <laughs> but he was rude. <laughs> And so we accomplished it. We just had to go out and rent her a costume that was bigger and more and that she could use better. She, uh, so it was a learning situation. I wouldn't work with the rudeness anymore, though. <laughs> this is two parts. I'm just wondering if you're going to start your own fashion line and are you going to consider doing a fashion show? No, I haven't. 
I'm a theater person, up to here. <laughs> I really like the play is the thing, and I like the play, and then I like, I'm married to an actor. You know, I'm all involved in, in theater and acting, and I just like the process. I suppose I could do a music video, because I think that's fascinating. That's like actors and dancers dressing them. But, you know, never thought I'd start a fashion design. Fashion is really way different from costume design. It's not the same at all. It, you might be able to make it work, but they're not the same. In fashion, because it's going to be sold to several people, it isn't that specific. In costume, it's really for that character. It's that person's clothes. It's not everybody's clothes. So it's a whole different, uh, the whole way I think about it when I'm designing the costume is just really for this woman who used to be a prostitute and now, in Three Penny Opera, for instance, Mrs. Peacham was a girl of the streets. Then she married this guy who dressed beggars so they could go out and beg and he, he got a percentage. So he dressed them to look like beggars. She ran the shop. So she's a very specific looking person, you know. It's not your average, nobody in, the, in their right mind would wear what she's wearing. <laughs> Uh, it's so specific to the show. It's not fashion design. I love fashion design. I'm a real clothes horse. I like clothing, but <laughs> I don't know. That's a whole different mm -hmm. ball of wax. Mm -hmm. Have you ever worked with your husband on the set? No, I don't, have, I don't do big movies. Okay. I've done, um, when he directed a play, I once was his designer, but I was the set designer then. That was fun. <laughs> Actually, he trusted me because he already knew what I could do. So we didn't have to talk about it a lot. Oh, well. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs>